Good evening, comrades. Thank you for joining us to a second session of the Communist Culture Club. We're very pleased to have a, a range of speakers tonight. Um, we're going to talk about June. We're going to talk about George Orwell. We're going to talk about the Cultural Intifada. But we're going to start with something we've just added uh, today, which is a discussion on Al Jazeera's new documentary, October 7. Um, Tony Greenstein can't be with us tonight. Unfortunately, it is in a different meeting. But I've interviewed him and I would recommend everybody watch it. It is quite harrowing in parts, but it's certainly useful um, for various reasons that we're going to discuss now. So thanks for joining us, Tony. Tony Greenstein is here with us to talk about Al Jazeera's new documentary, October 7. The investigative unit of the channel has um, featured evidence from the cameras of Hamas fighters and some Israeli soldiers, as well as interviews piecing together really a timeline of October 7, what happened when. But Tony, tens of thousands of Gazans have already been slaughtered by the Israeli army and many more will die because of starvation and disease. Why do you think is it important to look back at exactly what happened on October the 7th? Well, it's important to look back for this reason that October the 7th is the pretext for the genocide and the ethnic cleansing. And so I think we need to dismantle the Zionist narrative that this was a second Holocaust, that this was the greatest slaughter of Jews since the Second World War. And furthermore, it was an uncontrolled rape uh, frenzy orchestrated by Hamas with the aim of hurting and destroying and killing as many Jews as possible. In other words, it was nothing to do with the occupation. It was nothing to do with the suffocating siege. It was about the innate anti-Semitism and burning hatred for Jews as Jews by those who were living in the Gaza concentration camp. And that has been the Zionist narrative throughout. And they found it difficult at times certainly at the beginning, to get their story together. Because you remember 40 beheaded babies, a baked baby, apparently babies being hung on clotheslines. It was all of that. It was Visiting celebrities continue to be shown babies' cribs and the world continues to be told stories about murdered babies. When you're taking babies, cutting them and tying them together and burning them to death, you're treating them less than an animal. 1,300 people dead, murdered, babies. These bastards put these babies in an oven and put on their oven. We found the kid a few hours later. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken describes the fate of two small children. Family of four, a young boy and girl, six and eight years old, and their parents around the breakfast table. The father, his eye gouged out in front of his kids. The mother's breast cut off, the girl's foot amputated, the boy's fingers cut off before they were executed, and then their executioners sat down and had a meal. That's what this society is dealing with. This story also comes from Yossi Landau and Zaka. An analysis of the evidence suggests that it is also untrue. Of the 782 unarmed victims of October 7, 36 are children. 13 under the age of 12. None died in the circumstances described by Anthony Blinken. There were two babies who died, and one of them was just killed by a stray bullet. Mm. I mean, the, the documentary, I thought it was quite good because it is um, trying to stay with the facts, you know, and it's, it is saying Hamas did commit crimes, and there are some pretty gruesome scenes actually about the music festival. You remember when there's a, a group of young people in a in a bomb shelter and you can see it, you know, and Hamas goes in and basically executes them. But the, the tenor of the documentary is, you know, Hamas did commit crimes, but not many of the crimes that the Israeli government and the media are pretending it committed. For example, the, the 40 babies, but also it looks at the claim that there was mass uh, widespread and systematic rape and that is taken apart as well what, what what were for you the sort of standout moments from that documentary yeah i mean i i think the documentary showed a glimpse of what happened on that day and it 
it sequenced it so that we understand how it progressed. It's, that has not been done before in any uh, systematic fashion, and that was very useful. But uh, as you say, I mean, Hamas uh, aren't nursery school teachers. Yeah. I mean, this was not a children's picnic. It was an exercise where people who went did not expect to come back. Mm. Uh, and of course, uh, it, 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 if you like their liberation in uh, being in their occupiers territory for the first time, yes, atrocities were committed. Uh, uh, I'm sure, you know, you name me a slave revolt where, the, where uh, atrocities weren't committed. They were far more bloody affairs. Uh, the, in Haiti, the slave revolt, it killed every single French white person, man, woman, and child. I mean, one could not have defended that, but would one defend the right of the slaves to revolt and to free themselves? Yes. So, you know, I mean, it, 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 Hamas in many ways behaved impeccably uh, compared to, and it was a story in the Times of Israel. It was on, I think, the 9th of October. I put it on my blog where a Hamas fighter goes into a kibbutz home. The father lunges at him with an axe, I think, and he's, he's killed. The mother then attacks and she's killed. And there are two children there with their, I don't know whether th their mother, I think it was. Uh, and then Hamas writer writes on the wall, Hamas does not kill children, uh, and then puts a blanket around them. So, I mean, this idea that they deliberately went to kill the children and so on, I mean, it's totally untrue. And in fact, the statistics prove it. There were two babies. Mm. One I mean, some children were obviously killed and young people were killed. So very they, few. They, they were not, they're not saints. Um, but was interesting, the, um, as you pointed out, the, most of the Hamas fighters did not expect to live after this. They expected mm. to die within a few minutes, uh, hours. That whole aspect of the Israeli army not being prepared. I mean, this is an interesting one and it's being discussed widely as well. The, the documentary um, claims or shows, you know, Israel had warnings, plenty of warnings. Hamas fighters put their videos up with a paraglider, you know, training with the paragliders, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But they were totally, un they seemed totally unprepared. Some have speculated they let it happen on purpose. The documentary does not. Where do you still stand on that? Yes, I mean, it was described, or has been described, as the greatest intelligence failure since the Second World War. Uh, it was a massive intelligence failure. Uh, and why? Because of the hubris of the Israelis and also their, their racial arrogance. They did not believe that Hamas was capable of it, coupled with the fact that they trusted that their billion dollar fence with its automatic machine guns, sensors and so on, uh, could, would defeat anything. And yet very low tech drones and paragliders and bulldozers did the job. I mean, it, there were all sorts of lessons to be learned from that. Uh, but no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think it was that they were let in. Uh, it's inconceivable. Uh, it's much like 9-11, really. I mean, these conspiracy theories, but the political consequences, if it was ever found out that they deliberately let them in, would be too great. Uh, mm. Certainly, I, I, I don't think there's any chance. Yes, they were given warnings. That's, that was the case in 1973 with the Yom Kippur War. No, I, I don't buy into a conspiracy theory of that nature. Mm. So were there any other moments that you thought would make this documentary really useful to watch? Uh, I, I just think that the sequencing of it to see, for instance, that Hamas came first, then the other militias came second, and then the freelancers, mm. and, and who may well have raped the uh, odd individual woman. Rape and war, unfortunately, go together. Uh, no one's pretending it didn't happen at all. But what is absolutely clear is that this was not in, an intended uh, rape uh, or orgy, if you like. The purpose of Hamas and the other militias was clear, to capture as many people, to take them back as hostages. Uh, they clearly didn't think that this might be the pretext for ethnic cleansing of the whole of Gaza, uh, and that is a, a political mistake that they made, uh, without a doubt. But... Uh, uh, we can see that they wanted hostages, and of course they captured them in the not too uh, 
nice or gentle a fashion, but you would expect that. I mean, the documentary also shows that um, there is almost like um, a wild firing at people by the Israeli army once it's got going. And there's, you know, well, that's the other thing. I mean, yeah, military yeah. experts saying, you know, they've they've shot their own hostages quite clearly. Well, I mean, it's not an overwhelming numbers, it has to be said, but there was clearly, you know, a lot of confusion. Well, we don't know. We don't know what the numbers are. What we do know is that about midday, the Hannibal direct was put into operation and this is a kind of you know this is a kind of nazi doctrine that uh it's better to kill your own people than let them take be taken captive because then they can be exchanged for prisoners i mean i mean it's it's an unbelievable thing which puts no value by the israeli state even on its own jewish citizens when it comes to it that in, instead of doing everything possible to rescue they, they, they say it's better to kill them uh, why? Because they don't want to let Palestinian prisoners out free, and uh, that, in essence, is, is what it's about. And that's what a, what the invasion of Gaza is now. They're more interested in killing Palestinians than saving their own captives, and that tells you really everything about the morality of the Israeli state. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the day, the helicopters strafed concert goers. There, there's. There was more that, that wasn't shown. There were cars piled up on a highway by the festival, uh, and they seem to have been just a, a turkey shoot. Uh, we don't know how many uh, cars were hit, uh, but there were very considerable numbers. I mean, whether it's half or a third or a quarter, the fact is that of the 700 odd Israeli civilians, a large number were killed by their own people, including nearly all of those at Kibbutz Berry, which was 121, I think. Well, I mean, the, the documentary doesn't actually make that claim. Um, they they no. only went out a few 20 something unexplained reasons. So they, they, they are treading very carefully to not be sued, I guess, or whatever. But there's probably more, you think, yeah. Well, Kibbutz Berry lost 120, I know that. Uh, and tank shells were fired into every single house. Mm. Uh, and obviously, if you fire a tank shell into a house, you kill the people in it. And that's what happened. Uh, and the damage that was done, you know, we, we saw early on, we saw, you know, people kind of frozen black charred bodies in cars. And this was attributed to Hamas. But we know now they didn't have the weaponry to do that. Mm. That was Hellfire mass missiles. Uh, from the helicopters, the Apaches that were circling above. So, I mean, a considerable number were killed by the Israelis on the day, including actually quite a lot of soldiers. They bombed their own bases. They bombed the Eros Junction, for example. So uh, we will never know. We will mm. never know. And the Israeli army doesn't want to investigate that part of it for obvious no, reasons. That, that became clear as well. There's the UN <laughs> wants to send a, a unit in to investigate the, the, the claims of mass and systematic rape, and they've still not be allowed no. in. And it's quite powerful to hear them say that, you know, we've tried and we've tried again and we're not allowed in. So that shows really... Um, well, they've, dest they've destroyed all the forensic evidence. They've just buried the bodies. They mm. didn't take any until they let these religious uh, messianic nuts from uh what's it what's the group uh i can't remember now uh zaka that's right zaka, yeah who have no training whatsoever are on the far right uh and who just lied i mean you saw that guy who just lied lied and lied again yeah he, he swore he saw all these beheaded babies and so mm. on and they weren't even there. They didn't have. He says he, he's showing a picture on his mobile phone to the journalist, isn't it? Because he doesn't want to show it on on camera. And the journalist goes, "Well, where where's that baby? You know? Oh, it's over there. Can't you see it? No, I can't see. So it's not bullshit, isn't it? He's, he's yeah. exposed himself quite quite beautifully on that in that film. And then he well, says, anyone who questions uh, what he says uh, should be killed. Yeah. So. <laughs> yes. Thanks very much, Tony. It's a very worthwhile uh, documentary to watch. Uh, everybody should. Yes, indeed. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Tony. Thanks very much, um, Tony. Before we discuss that, though, we propose that we go to our second item first, which is um, a discussion with Tamdeen Byrne, actor, Scottish actor, about part of how we can actually fight back and how we can stand up and show solidarity with the Palestinians, which is about the cultural intifada. Tam, hi. Yeah, hi, Tina. 
Hi, everybody. Um, just to say, uh, first, on, on top of uh, what's just been seen, the other place to get uh, a lot of information on what actually happened on October 7th and refutals of the lies that have been perpetrated by well, the New York Times and so many that does get touched on in, um, in, in the film there, Al Jazeera, is the Electronic Intifada. Um, they, they are a real touchstone for me of uh, trying to make sense of what's going on, finding out the actual information. Um, there is a, a wealth of proof that um, that October the 7th uh, was, especially on things like this Hannibal Directive. I mean, where, where have any of the, uh, the mainstream media even mentioned this term at all? Um, and this is, you know, a massive part of the problem is that um, we, Al Jazeera and Electronic Intifada are one of the, they are just, there's only very few um, news agencies given anything like the truth at all and not completely bound up in, uh, in feeding the lies. Um, but it's clearly not um, not convincing people. Uh, people can see through it uh, more and more now. And uh, there is such a massive level of activity going on. Um, and in the cultural sphere, that's what interests me uh, uh, most. As you said, I'm an actor. Um, and uh, I came across another actor who came to Glasgow in, 2007, uh, he's only a month older than me, um, and his name is Giuliano Mercamus, and he had made a film of uh, his mother's work, Arna Mayer. She was um, she was uh, a member of the Communist Party of Israel, and so was his dad, um, and then and she she had previously even been. Uh, quite a overt Zionist activist, but uh, when she was when she was asked to um, to attack Bedouin tribes, uh, she rebelled and completely flipped over and turned into a well class traitor as such. Um, and um, then did a lot of work in Janine refugee camp, especially with the first Intifada um, and helping children there because their their education system had uh, had collapsed, uh, and uh, and and she started up working there, and um, Giuliano went, um, and uh, he'd been a very successful uh, Israeli actor, um, and uh, uh, he went there and started filming what his mum was doing, and um, this eventually became a documentary. She she died in. 95 um and giuliano then went back to working in theater in israel for seven years but then he finished off this film uh this documentary um that came out in 2004 uh called arna's children and it's an absolutely wonderful uh documentary it's it's on youtube i'll put the link up um arna Arna's children. Um, it won many awards uh, the, uh, for it as a as a documentary, um, and, um, and it, it showed how theatre had been helping these children. Um, but then the the Israelis went in and 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 destroyed it. I mean, their theatre at that time they called it the Stone Theatre. Um, and uh, that was in honor of all of the children that were throwing stones at, uh, at the Israeli forces um, because it was a theater of rebellion. It was, um, it was considering itself as a cultural intifada. And um, he then, with uh, Zakaria Zubedi, um, who has been 
quite famous in more recent times for being one of the six um, uh, prisoners that escaped using the spoon um, just a couple of years ago. Um, and it, one of the most extraordinary before, before October the 7th um, uh, abilities of um, to be able to break the uh, Israeli security and he escaped and he was on the run, but he has been captured again since. But with um, Giuliano, Zakaria um, Zabedi set up what they called the Freedom Theater and uh, in Janine refugee camp. Uh, and um, it was an extraordinary theater that gained worldwide significance. I mean, and this is a children's youth theater. Um, and it shows how culture can make such a difference. You know, a tiny little place there um, became known throughout the world. Um, and to the extent uh, that um, Giuliano was assassinated, still never been uh, um, uh, really fully investigated of what happened to him, but he was shot through the head in his car with his two-year-old son sitting on his lap. Um, so, you know, they've gone about atrocities and, you know, this has been going on. It's been for decades and decades. Um, and um, the Freedom Theatre has carried on since they've been under a lot of attack. Um, their uh, producer, uh, Mustafa Shetty, is still in prison now under this administrative detention. That means that the, uh, they can hold you without charge for as long as they like. Um, and uh, several other members of Freedom Theatre, a children's theatre, have been banged up in similar fashion and tortured. Um, and they destroyed the theatre. Uh, but uh, there is there is still that groundswell of uh, recognition that uh, it's important and it is a means of fighting back and also a means of dealing with the whole post-traumatic stress that young people have uh, have been put through over the years and never more so uh, than now. Um, so this cultural intifada, which you know, I I wanted to give the talk primarily because another guy who has become a hero to me, but sadly only since he died, Rifat al uh, a lecturer at the Islamic University in Gaza. Again, him as, uh, assassinated in uh, November. An extraordinary guy um, and such a loss. And again, targeted. Uh, specifically because of the work that he was doing culturally with young people. Um, I wanted to then look at this whole question um, and in order to, to, to explore uh, his work and, and, and other work within uh, that's been happening in Palestine uh, closer, uh, which I've only partly been able to do, but I've got the ball rolling on that score. But his... his um, his lectures that he gave to his students in English because he believed that students should learn English so that they could use that as a weapon uh, to speak to the world. And Shakespeare being a weapon that they could use, um, he, he put a lot of store by that of uh, learning and understanding Shakespeare and his students really uh, it, it took that up. And that to me is just extraordinary as well. Um, the, there is students in uh, Gaza who, in uh, 2010, 2014, they uh, produced these um, Gaza monologues, um, writing about what they were going through. And uh, there was a performance of these that was called for on the, what day was that, I think, October the 29th? Uh, on November the 29th, you lose track of these months. Eh? It's just been a perpetual onslaught. Uh, but it fundamentally, it was on the day of the, the UN Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. And um, there was a call to 
perform these monologues around the world. And uh, this was done in so many countries across the world. There was a lot done here in Scotland, um, we, in Glasgow and Edinburgh. We, um, we performed these monologues by these young Gazan uh, uh, youth. Um, and they had such resonance, even though they, they had been written 10 years before, uh, they were the all guard what, uh, what has been going on in the last uh, five months. And there's been new ones getting written. And uh, I've, I've done one of them for uh, an album that's come out um, that has um, been a fundraiser um, uh, for Gaza. Uh, and it was called um, From Shakespeare to Gaza, a call for William Shakespeare 400 years on to come to their aid quite extraordinary I find um, but also this cultural intifada um, that has been launched this week by uh, the Freedom Theatre and artists on the front line um, it, it's, it's there as an extraordinary website already of uh, materials that can be used and techniques that can be used, the material that can be used, there you go. <laughs> um, and um, it's, it's the proof that um, this global artistic movement is happening um, right now. I've seen so much evidence of it here in, in Britain, in Scotland and Britain, and it's being, um, it's, it's like a, a more, you know, in the in the few months, sort of in the middle of last year, I started committing much more to doing uh, cultural work on climate, uh, the climate emergency. And I found with that, and now with 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 this struggle, it's it's in the main young women that are leading the way on these issues. Uh, and on these cultural fronts. And I find that extraordinarily inspiring, inspiring. Uh, especially, you know, being an old white male commie, uh, you tend to find that that's the sort of company you find yourself in often. And um, I mean, even the, the people that's speaking uh, tonight is, you know, similar in a way, um, but it's young women that are leading the way on this. In, in all sorts of extraordinary ways. And um, that's what really heartens me, that this is, this is a, a struggle that is now worldwide, that is rooted in the, uh, the fight for uh, Palestinian rights and uh, freedom, but it's also tied in with uh, the climate, those connections, I'm seeing it, the, the climate groups in Glasgow, um, are connecting, you know, parents um, uh, for, uh, for for Fridays, which you know, are, there is a uh, climate groups going on. They recognise, they recognise the uh, these are the same struggles, and this is what the above all is most important. That taking our inspiration from Palestine, and uh, and on the climate, that these our enemies are clearly the very same. Uh, and they have exposed themselves completely. All they have to offer is war and genocide, and uh, that is capitalism. It is that that is the uh, the where our enemy really lies, and people are recognizing that more and more. And uh, I can see that uh, culture is is going to be playing more and more of a part in that, and so. I'm glad that this has happened now. Communist Culture Club is uh, is is what's needed and um, to to be exploring these issues. So I'll leave it there just now. Yeah. Thank you very much, comrade. That was really inspiring. Uh, it, it's fantastic. I mean, a that you know, young Gazans or people in Gaza can use culture as a way to express themselves or fight back, but also that we can use it here as a way to show solidarity and to collectivize, isn't it? It's also, we need to collectivize and, and build our own organizations, our own forces to have some kind of power to stop 
stop the slaughter and stop our governments from from doing what they're doing and there is there are very few avenues especially with the right to strike right to protest being under such um threat at the moment so thank you very much tam if anybody would like to discuss or say anything on the first two items raise your hand uh, i mean don't just do that click the button raise hand and i can bring you in there's um lots of issues to discuss um i think dan did you want to say something because you had you had some some differences perhaps with with tony if you if you want to speak just click raise hand and i can i can bring you in sure can you hear me now or yes we can hear you. Okay. great 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 uh yeah i mean, I mean uh, tony and i have uh, have had numerous disagreements uh uh um tony is um i mean he's really energetic he's really a fighter uh, but I think that uh, that some of the things he says simply just are not uh, are not factual. Uh, the the film was very careful. It spoke about twenty seven. It discussed uh, twenty seven unexplained deaths, and there may have been a, a few more in this uh, in this kibbutz called uh, 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 Barry, which came under attack when the the um, one of the major assaults that took place. Um, and where Tony says the majority of the deaths were caused by the Israelis, that I have just have no idea where that comes from. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, it just doesn't add up. Um, uh, we know that the, the Tony is right and the film is right, that this was a, a, a fantastic, I mean, this is one of the most amazing intelligence failures uh, we have ever seen in modern military history. Uh, um, uh, and as a consequence, the, the response, the Israeli response was, was very delayed. It was very confused. It was very haphazard. Uh, and there were uh, undoubtedly uh, friendly fire incidents where Israelis' uh, helicopters uh, you know, fired on, on cars heading back to Gaza, not really knowing who was in those cars. Uh, and uh, it's it's quite reasonable to believe that uh, that two or three dozen people were killed in those circumstances. Uh, but I'd point out that 27 is merely about two or three percent of the total. Uh, so something really, really bad happened on October 7th. Um, and I think there's no there's no shrinking from that fact and attempts to sort of massage those facts and wish that away. Uh, I just are not counterproductive. I think the first task of Marxists is to stare reality in the face, uh, to look at it with all its complexity, all its brutality, all its horror, but to not look away, to not try to deny certain facts. And, and one of those facts is that October 7th is really bad. Um, and I think it's, um, it's simply, uh, I, there's, I do not by any means wish to to make any excuses for the Israelis, because I think it's quite right. The Israelis, uh, the Zionists, are really using this as an excuse to engage in a in um, ethnic cleansing and and you know and a a massive brutal military assault, which is I think I think the death count now is up to uh, thirty two thousand, and I'm sure it'll go many times higher before the uh, this this war is finished, um, but. We've got to understand the war in all its complexity, and we've got to understand, uh, we've got to diagnose it in order to come up with a cure. Uh, and, and that means taking all the facts into account uh, in as clear and, and objective a fashion as we can. Um, uh, I, I just would point out that, that Lenin and Trotsky uh, 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 and Lenin wrote about this repeatedly. Lenin was a was a great pioneer uh, on the national question. Uh, in contrast, to people like Rosa Luxemburg, he emphasized time and again that the the national question was central. Uh, it could not be skirted. Uh, Marxists must fight for the um, for the for for liberation and equality of all oppressed nations. All oppressed nations had the same. All nations. Period had the same right to, uh, to equality, independence, free development, et cetera. Uh, but, but Lenin stressed uh, time and again, I'm thinking of um, an article he wrote in 1915 and his famous notes on the national questions were published in, in 1920, I believe. Um, 
he stressed that national de development could only take place in, uh, in an international socialist community. In other words, nations could not develop in an, in an egotistical fashion. They could only develop like an, like an individual. An individual can only develop as part of a, uh, a democratic socialist community. And an individual nation is, a, is the same thing, really. And, uh, and Lenin uh, talked about, uh, about national independence for the, uh, for the colonial world uh, as a means of, of achieving uh, international proletarian unity on a higher level. The, 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 it was important to uh, emphasize uh, national equality as the, uh, in this context. Um, and, uh, and surely, surely, surely slaughtering hundreds of your fellow workers is not the way to achieve uh, proletarian un uh, unity. Um, so, uh, so I think that, um, I, and Lenin's thesis that the, that, that the international proletariat proletariat was the only force capable of being, uh, of achieving national liberation. I think this has been uh, uh, horribly, catastrophically, but quite spectacularly uh, illustrated by, uh, by Gaza. I mean, what we're seeing is that, uh, yes, Hamas uh, succeeded in swatting the tiger on the nose, um, but then what happened is that once the tiger recovered its senses, uh, in a matter of hours, uh, there was hell to pay. Uh, and what we've seen now has been the ongoing military defeat of the Palestinian people. Uh, this is being called a, a Nakba II. Uh, Nakba I, of course, being the mass expulsions of 1947 to 49. Uh, but I think Nakba II is actually incorrect because I think what we're seeing is Nakba squared. Uh, simply the greatest uh, defeat suffered by the Palestinian people in the history of the, uh, of the modern Palestinian movement. And Hamas's disastrous role in this uh, has got to be faced uh, squarely. So that's it. Thank you. I don't think the documentary was very soft on Hamas, I have to say. I mean, you know, they're linked, uh, you know, Qatar, et cetera. But it is, I thought they were, at the end, particularly, you see the, the guy from the political bureau, you know, after after we've seen after we've seen scenes of Gazans starving and, you know, being slaughtered, et cetera, he says, well, you know, that's the sacrifice they're willing to make. And it it doesn't really look like the Palestinians were going to wanting to make that kind of sacrifice. So I think there's a, you know, there is there is criticism of Hamas in in that program as well. So I thought it was quite, it was quite um, objective or as objective as it could be. So thanks, Dan. Um, Paul, please. Uh, yeah, um, just carry on from this discussion that uh, that Dan started here of what Tony said. Um, I thought uh, when this attack first took place, I thought, well, they've been allowed to do this. And then I started thinking a bit more about it. And then I thought, well, that, I mean, nothing would uh, surprise me with Netanyahu and his friends. I mean, they're completely amoral. They're completely cynical. Uh, but to have carried out a stunt like that would have involved an awful lot of other people in the military and intelligence uh, sectors in Israel. And that that was the area where a lot of the opposition to Netanyahu was coming from in those big demonstrations. So uh, that made me think, well, no, this is it's not a false flag job, but it's just still quite unbelievable that it was allowed to happen, that uh, they let it happen by you know, gazing elsewhere. Uh, it does seem amazing, but that seems to be the case. They weren't just weren't looking. But um, coming back to uh, what uh, I think Tony was saying, now I think that Hamas must have known that an Israeli government, and especially one of the far right, would respond not just strongly but catastrophically. Uh, we've all known from, from uh, comrades like Tony, from uh, Moshe Machover and other people that the Israeli right, the Zionist right, has always wanted to finish off the Nakba, get rid of the Palestinians altogether from what they see as uh, Greater Israel. In fact, I was just reading a, a book the other day uh, and it mentions that uh, 
but Melech in Beugin came out with this in 1948. He said, this is just the foundation. Soon we're going to have the uh, you know, Israel from the river to sea, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then, uh, so that's always been on their agenda. And of course, Amos has given them the excuse to do this, the Amos attack. So why did Amos do it? Now, I think that what they was aiming at was to provoke a response, probably not as much as they, has happened, but they wanted a big response from Israel. And that would, they, I think, they hoped, would lead to a conflagration right across the Middle East, as all the states that are hostile to Israel would pile in. But as we know, the, uh, the Iranian regime wants a level of instability within the Middle East. But it certainly doesn't want a war because it would come out of it very badly. Hezbollah has got its own fight with Israel, which doesn't correspond with, with uh, Hamas and the Palestinian thing in general. Uh, we do have historical precedents in wanting to, a nationalist organisation wanting to provoke a major conflagration and then try and get something out of the wreckage. If we look at the uh, Ukrainian nationalists of the 1930s, the organisation of uh, Ukrainian nationalists, uh, they were banking on the Second World War, you know, the Germany versus the Soviet Union, and hopefully get a Ukrainian state out of that conflagration. Well, they did for about three weeks until the Nazis stamped on it. After the war, Stefan Bandera, the main leader of the uh, OUN, was hoping for a, a, a USA versus Soviet Union war because he hoped that a, a Ukrainian state would come out of the wreckage there, a very rather radioactive one, but uh, so, but nevertheless, that's what he was gaining by that. So this kind of catastrophism of provoking a war and then hoping that something will come out of it is not un unknown. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what uh, Hamas's tactics were. But as I thought at the time, as I told friends at the time, I said, this is a massive own goal. And uh, I really think that the what uh, Israel is doing now is basically to drive the Palestinians out of Gaza. And, uh, after all, someone said, you know, this dock they're building to, uh, to load, unload boats from Cyprus could also be used for shifting Palestinians out on, on ships. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. Um, and Tony isn't here to, to respond, but I've had lots of meetings with him since and Moshe, and um, he they both actually don't think that Hamas believed that the rest of the states, the Arab states, would take action. It was more they, you know, because they they are run by despots who often have dealings now with Israel as well. So, but they they both were saying that um, they believe this that Hamas's strategy, if you if you can call it that, was to stop the normalization of the oppression of Israelis. You had Saudi Arabia and Israel, you know, they they're having discussions on a diplomatic level, etc. And they would it was just a sort of an act of despair, you know, in that we're still here. But I don't think they expected, that's what Moshe and Tony are saying, and they, they know this kind of stuff better than me. They didn't expect the Arab states to come to their rescue. They just wanted to have it back on the agenda, and they succeeded in that, at least. But thank you. Thank you, um, Paul. Um, Ian. Good evening, comrades. Um, I, I, I saw the film today, and I thought it was excellent. I mean... I don't think there's anything in the film that, that tries to glorify Hamas at all. Um, it, it certainly isn't. I mean, it, it, it tries to show it in a, 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 a documentary style. And in a sense, as Tina's already pointed out, really, Hamas is condemned out of their own mouths, really. But what really struck me uh, was a couple of things. Firstly, the, the, the Israeli Defence Force isn't very good, that despite enormous resources vast uh, expenditure on on um, weapons that, that considering what's spent on them they're actually not that good and that's because i suspect that a lot of their time is, is spent spent fighting kids throwing stones or 
bullying people on the West Bank or whatever. Um, the, the, the striking thing, uh, I mean, things I, I was completely unaware of, was that a lot of the destruction to the, the, one of the kibbutz that was um, that was shown was by weapons that clearly Hamas didn't possess. You know, you you can't demolish a whole house with a with a rocket propelled grenade, um, and just things like that, really. And it seems to me that the Israeli Defense Force, once they were presented with um, what to them must have been a, a catastrophe happening on their watch, simply opened up by destroying everything. Uh, and from that point of view, that's a horribly ill-disciplined army. Um, I've been watching recent retired British Army uh, commentators on um, the actions of the IDF. And even things like um, rounding up a load of uh, people from the Al-Shifa hospital or wherever else and, and parading them around in their underpants and, and putting them in stress positions and the rest of it is the kind of thing a really ill-disciplined army would do. And you can't see the point of it unless it's... Um, to appeal to a kind of home audience or whatever, you're certainly absolutely guaranteeing the next generation of, of, of fighters against you. Um, what was, um, and of course the other thing was, it was the, the, the hubris that, that led them to uh, ignore uh, the intelligence that, that they knew. They would be told that Hamas were, were on the way, but they just thought, oh, it can't possibly happen. Even once the um, maneuvers had started, uh, they they sort of acted very slowly, and then all of a sudden, of course, they had to act um, very very quickly, and they, they basically then just shot everything that moved, and, and that's one of the problems with the attack helicopters. You can't discern one friend or or, or other, and obviously the, the the Hannibal directive has been a real feature, and again, it's a sign of a really poorly run, poorly led army uh it, it, you know you why would you do that it's it's completely destructive to your own your own ends um the the, the damage sim to to the the kibbutz just simply couldn't have been done um by anybody but the idea i mean and, and probably only by by tanks so you've got a bizarre situation where the idea of, uh, rolled into one of their own kibbutzim and just started blasting away with a tank um I don't. I can't see any other possible conclusion. And the um, commentator that was was a was a British military expert analyst who didn't have any kind of axe to grind, particularly as far as I can see. The other thing is, I mean, friendly fire incidents are not at all uncommon, and um, you know they often happen in the heat of the moment, and you know people would, you've got a split second, and you don't you can't tell whether it's a, an enemy or a or, or a friend. But this was just seemed to be just shoot everything that moved and hope that God sorts them out. It was a, it's a it's a film which I think should be absolutely mandatory viewing. As regards all the atrocities, they're very very easily debunked and they have been now for some time. And it's now what the I mean the most significant casualty is any any kind of um, idea that the IDF or, or Israel has any kind of legitimacy whatsoever. Uh, but yes, thank you. Thanks, Ian. I mean, there, you know, the the film does not um, deny that there were atrocities um, by the by Hamas and by, as Tony says as well, that they they are showing that you know once the gates were open, all sorts of people started pouring into into Israel and you know using the opportunity to loot and to do well possibly other other things as well but it is uh, i thought it was quite a, an even handed um film and it is very very interesting so do check it out comrades steve please i'll be quick tina i just wanted to make this point i haven't actually seen these films but i just want to make this comment it's a bit like the french revolution you remember that somebody said i don't know not long ago that it uh, might have even been lenin 100 years later french revolution too early to say the consequences of that. And I think it's too early to judge the impact of what's happened. I mean, we can count numbers, 33,000 people dead as compared to 1,200 people dead on the other side. You know, the balance there is, is massively 
terrible the destruction, etc. But really, what you had here was a, a rebellion, an armed uprising, really, by a resistance movement against an oppressor uh, state. And um, I think that uh, we we don't know really because if you if you just think another example, the Easter uprising that was crushed in 1916. Well, what did that lead to? Well, it was complete and utter defeat. People said it was a complete and utter waste of time. And yet within two or three years, the whole situation had changed and Ireland had gone into a, a, a popular revolution that led to the British being driven out. So we cannot say yet how this movement, because it's an international thing, it's not just there. Look at what America's about to do. Look what Israel is. So the whole thing is much more complicated and it's literally too soon to see whether this uprising will ultimately have a progressive impact on the situation or complete and utter disaster in terms of how how the whole thing pans out. That's all I want to say, really. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, I'm working on a piece at the moment um, that's about David Bowie's album, Diamond Dogs, uh, that came out coming up for 50 years ago, uh, that begins with the refrain, they're saying rock and roll, this is genocide. Um, and he wrote that album with the intention of making a musical of 1984. Uh, but Orwell's wife wouldn't let him. She wouldn't give the rights at all. Um, so he included some songs called Big Brother and 1984, but he couldn't do the musical. Uh, but um, putting the whole thing through the prism of Gaza, diamond dogs, the Israeli diamond trade and dogs, packs of dogs in the streets in Gaza, eating flesh from the rubble. So that's going to be a fun piece. Um, yeah, I just wanted really to bring up I mean, the um, the, the the way that the, the establishment are, are recognizing the dangers to them of cultural intifada, it's going on to a just absolutely disgraceful extent. In this country, uh, we've seen it. I mean, Germany is supposed to be you know, the worst for it, but. Uh, I know a young artist that had an exhibition going on in the University of the Highlands and a week, and because she had a Gazi, an artist from Gaza involved in it, they pulled the plugs on the exhibition less than a week before it was going to open. Uh, Chicken Shed Theatre in London, North London, that is claims to be so inclusive and uh, is a children's theater really they had a set of nine plays on that the show had opened short plays and this young playwright she was performing her own play about her trying to get in touch and communicate with her dad in Palestine even although the show had opened two nights they pulled the plugs on her short play in it uh, and then tried to force the, the guy who reviewed the play and gave a very favourable review to her piece. Tr they tried to get him to take out any reference to her in his review. Um, and on International Women's Day in Brighton, the Brighton Women's Centre uh, pulled the plugs on a stall that was going to be run by uh, Palestinian women for for children and families. And that's just the ones I've heard about. Um, and then the, the Arts Council of England brought in a, a, a new doctrine saying that individuals within funded bodies, their statements uh, could affect the company's funding. Uh, they backtracked from that, but the damage had been done. The intention, and it's as well as this, the state, you know, rules and regulations, the, the way that they've been talking about treating 
uh, I mean, Starmer, his one, one of his pledges that he's sticking to is take back our streets. Who do you think he's talking about? Who are they going to take the streets back from? Um, so this is something that the left should be aware of and be recognising and doing all they can uh, to, to, uh, to fight these attacks on culture because they're going to get worse for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a way that we, uh, we can be helping uh, cultural organisations while they at the same time have to find their independence have to find their ways around uh, these problems with public bodies and so on. Um, but also there's the side of things that there's a lot of, there's a young theatre director now in Brighton is going to be standing against Peter Kyle, um, the loathsome Labour MP, quite high up now in Starmer's party, um, in, uh, in Hove. So these are the sorts of candidates I think that we can certainly rally around more enthusiastically, maybe than gorgeous George, but um, there's big fights on, on the hand that culture is going to be involved in, I think, in, in lots of different ways. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's all I wanted to say, really. Thanks, everybody. Um, I Check out Tom, the, the website that Tom mentioned, um, the culturalintifada.com. I put it in the chat again. It's really inspiring, really important that we don't just go to demonstrations and but use our voices in every way we can. And this is a very good way to get involved in, in the resistance. Thank you, Tom. Uh, let us know if anything new comes up or if there are any uh, online webinar events that we can publicize, etc. We'll put that in the bulletin that goes out to everybody. Thank you. Um, we're now taking a look at June from a communist perspective. And we've got with us Jackson Mann from the US. Um, I have to admit, I'm not an expert on June. I've seen bits of the films, um, bit of a drag, but a nice enough entertaining um, um, science fiction. But um, I am interested because um, I saw Jackson has written an article uh, uh, for his magazine Cosmonaut in the US uh, about the June from a communist perspective. And the bits I saw, we're all about, you know, a chosen savior, Paul, the Messiah. He's the one. And basically it's up to him to liberate everybody, which is kind of the opposite of what communism is about. So, Jackson, what can we actually as communists learn and take away from from June? Um, uh, I had a whole presentation, but I think I'm just going to answer this because. Sorry. Uh, no, no, you're good because you're like you're uh, you're leaving. You're like putting me in the middle of what my presentation would be. So I think it might make sense to just talk a little bit about it kind of on the fly, as opposed to giving you all the sort of background of the created world and all that nonsense. Um, so yeah, I mean, Dune, um, I'm sure that many people who are listening have read this book. It's a classic uh, sort of speculative fiction book, science fiction uh, from 1965. It was written by Frank Herbert. Um, who until that point was relatively unknown. He was kind of just, a, he was a journalist, mostly for local news outlets, uh, different parts of the West Coast, mostly, he mostly lived on the West Coast for most of his life of, of the United States. Um, but yeah, it was his breakout hit. Um, it led to a sort of six book series that was incredibly, incredibly famous. Um, his son then went on to write like something like 50 more of these books. Um, so there's a lot of them. Um, so my analysis of Dune um, really kind of brackets the first the first novel. Um, it doesn't really make sense if you continue to read the rest of the books, what I have to say about the first book. Um, as Tina was saying, like the, the book is, is, is quite reactionary on its face. Uh, it's an unbelievably reactionary uh, work. Um, it's very, very homophobic. It's incredibly misogynistic. Um, the sort of level of Orientalism that is present in the book, I would describe as tiresome. It is incredibly difficult to read because of how Orientalist, in, in an almost like comical way, uh, the book is. 
And then I think even even underneath all of those sort of like aspects of it that are just reactionary on their face, um, the book really is a is a book for the ruling class. Um, it's a book about educating people how to rule. Um, and so it's it, it has a lot in common with um, Opera Seria. So um, for those who might not know, Opera Seria is, is basically a catch all sort of periodization term that's used in historical musicology to refer to opera. Uh, sort of pre-French Revolutionary opera. Um, so before the French Revolution, uh, most operatic productions were kind of oriented around much more of a sort of court-based um, sort of circuit of theaters. And so obviously the, the thematic sort of quality of these operas was very much oriented towards the ruling class who would, the, the people who would be in these theaters. Um, and many of the themes were about sort of like good governance, um, teaching sort of young nobles, like very didactic sort of elite didacticism, teaching young nobles how to rule effectively. And on the surface, uh, the first Dune novel is that's basically what it's about. Um, it's about teaching sort of young nobility how to rule. Um, it does this in a number of ways. Uh, one of the sort of primary scenes that I often refer to with regard to this aspect of the novel um, is in the center of the book, there's sort of two back-to-back -back scenes in which the primary protagonist, Paul, who's this sort of hero figure that Tina mentioned, um, uh, is kind of like contrasted with the character that the narrative is slowly setting up to be his rival. Uh, and this is, th that character's name is Fade Routha Harkonnen who's from like an opposing noble house. Um, so in these two back-to-back -back scenes, um, both of the characters are put into situations where they need to sort of fight another person to prove their sort of ability to rule. Uh, and in both cases, they kill their opponent. Um, but in the first scene featuring Paul, his sort of emotional reaction to the killing of his opponent is one of like deep regret. Um, he like very openly like sort of weeps about the death of this person. Even during the fight, he's very resistant. He asks the person to yield. Um, and he only really, he only kills his combatant after he's told that he has to because in the sort of desert culture that he's found himself in, um, and if you've read the book, you, there's a lot of background to this, but uh, but in the desert culture that he, he's found himself in because he escaped from the Harkonnens killing his family or whatever, um, it's like he ha basically culturally he's expected to kill a, a combatant who has who's failed. Um, so he has to. But again, he does it with all this sort of restraint um, and he ends up sort of getting like he ends up receiving the respect of the other members of this group of people. Um, the Fremen, who are these sort of indigenous people of the planet um, that he's on, uh, because he's shown he's shown so much restraint about having to kill this one of his subjects, you know, quote unquote. Um, in the the second scene that features the rival character Fade Routha, um, Fade Routha is just like totally excessive, extremely. He shows he he's he's unbelievably violent to his subjects. Um, he just kills them on a whim in, in, in incredibly horrific ways. Um, he uses their deaths in these very like devious ways to make himself look better. Um, and so the, this, these two scenes back to back where we sh were shown sort of the heroic sort of protagonist and the main villain sort of in the same sort of circumstances, but reacting in very, very different ways to those circumstances is sort of probably the most explicit instance of how this how dune is supposed to be teaching young nobles like the appropriate sort of way that they should be interacting with their subjects um but there's a number of scenes throughout the book that do this that's just sort of the central one it also focuses a lot on the development of sort of ruling class consciousness um so there's many many scenes in throughout dune in which sort of different characters who are of the ruling class uh, or of the sort of administrative classes that run the sort of, you know, intergalactic civilization that exists in this sci-fi world. Um, there are many scenes in which these different characters sort of come to mutually recognize one another as rulers, as like fellow members of the ruling class. Um, and there is one scene in particular that that is very intense with regard to this, um, where the sort of the, one of the main villains of the book 
uh, the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. Um, he has captured his 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 sort of nemesis, who's one of the protagonists, the the the, the father of the main protagonist, Duke Leto. He's captured Duke Leto, and he means to execute him. Um, but there's a brief moment in which you see the sort of inner thoughts of the Baron, where he he doesn't want to do it. He I think the exact quote is he was quote reluctant to subject another noble person to so much pain end quote i think that's the almost the exact quote um and so that scene is this very intense moment in which it's revealed to us that actually even the vil the sort of one of the villainous characters of this story is reluctant to kill his rival as a result of his, his sort of his subjectivity as a part of the ruling class and so the novel is very much a, a book for the ruling class on its face. Um, but there are certain sort of aspects of the way in which the book sort of frames the sociality of the ruling class that I do think are very interesting for socialists. Um, the, these are mostly the result of this sort of social nihilism of the author. So Frank Herbert was very, very nihilistic. He had a very, very poor view of humanity. Um, he tended to see ruling classes in a very negative light, even if he also did not see sort of subaltern subjects as any better. So he was he was very, very socially nihilistic. But because of that, the sort of ruling class of Dune's world ends up being sort of not necessarily positive, even though they are the protagonists of the book. Um, so the way in which I think that this is registered throughout the book, and some of you may know this, but in Dune, all of the sort of ruling class characters, the sort of imperial administrators of this big space galactic empire, they all have superpowers. Um, they all have these sort of superhuman powers, um, many of which are said to be the result of something called spice melange. Um, so this is this sort of psychoactive drug that comes from the planet that most of the story takes place on, um, that, that all these sort of characters in the created world believe give you elongated life and like these kind of superhuman powers and psychic abilities and prescience and all this stuff um so all the sort of ruling class characters were told as a reader have these sort of superhuman abilities as a result of the spice there's some eugenic arguments for why they have them um all different sorts of arguments um for why they have them now one of the main super sort of human abilities that many of the characters in the book have is this thing called the voice. Um, so this is the ability to basically psychically bend the will of others using your voice alone. The main organization in the sort of created world that makes use of this power is the Bene Gesserit. So this is like a sororal uh, sort of order of noble women who train themselves to be able to do this, to sort of bend the will of others. And so, yeah, we're told that these powers exist over and over. Um, and in the films, all the screen adaptations, and in the later books, this is why I was saying earlier that this really only works if you're talking about the first book, um, these powers are pretty much unambiguous. Like, all the characters really do have superpowers. They all have these superhuman powers, and it's real. But if you just read the first book, you'll notice that in the first novel, it's not actually clear that these powers exist. Um, it's it's not clear that they're real. Almost all of the sort of explicit representations of the uses of these powers are very ambiguous what's actually happening. So the one scene that I often point out with regard to this that I think is a very good example is a very, very famous scene in which um, Paul, the main character, and his mother, Jessica, both of whom have survived the attack on their planet that like starts much of the story, um, both try to use this power to escape some soldiers who have taken control of them. Um, so in the movies, this is always represented as just like a totally unambiguous use of like a psychic power or like a, a superpower. Um, but in the books, it's like not clear that that's what actually happens. Um, so, so in the movies, every time, uh, I've seen now three screen adaptations, there's three screen adaptations of this that I've seen the scene in every single one basically jessica the mother of the protagonist uses this power the voice to order one of the soldiers that's that has captured them to kill another soldier and 
she uses the power and the soldier does it and they kill each other and they escape. In the book, what actually happens is very, very strange. So they capture the two soldiers, they capture Paul and Jessica and they bring them onto this like ship that they're going to they're going to take them out into the desert and leave them there to die. Um, so as they're traveling on the ship, they gag Jessica because both the soldiers know that Jessica has this power or they're they're aware that that she has this power or has claimed to have this power. But they don't gag Paul, the sort of protagonist. So they're traveling out into the desert. And the two soldiers start talking about that they want to rape Jessica before they leave the character, these two characters in the, in the desert. This sort of shocks Paul. He, he, be, he begins to like, um, he, he, he begins to sort of get really nervous and he tries to use the voice on the soldiers to get them to, to undo Jessica's gag so that she can use her even more developed powers to get them to kill each other. Now, Jessica in the book says in her, she's talking to herself, she says, oh, that, that was a perfect use of the voice. But the soldiers don't listen to him. The soldiers actually don't react to his use of the voice, which is very strange, right? If this power was real and he used it perfectly, why would they not react? They actually have like a short conversation about what they should do, um, whether they should undo her gag before they rape her. And so they, they, they decide to do it. So they, go, they do go undo her gag, but it's not because Paul told them to or used this power to force them to do it. They do it kind of of their own accord. And then all of the films have Jessica order the sold, one soldier to kill the other soldier. That's not what happens in the book. In fact, what happens is that Jessica, once her gag, she doesn't have a gag anymore, she says, I think it's something like, quote, there's no need to fight over me. That's what she says. And that suddenly changes the attitude of the two soldiers because they, they're, they're sort of like hyped up because they've just been in this battle. They're kind of like really, really intense and emotional. They suddenly think that they're going to have to fight over Jessica and they end up fighting over who gets to rape her first, which leads them to attack each other and kill each other kind of accidentally. And so this isn't Jessica using a like superhuman power to get them to kill each other. She's actually just using the power of suggestion. So it's really, and, and, and this is just like a particular scene, but this is almost every demonstration of these powers is very ambiguous like this. It's like, it's not clear that these powers are actually happening. Can I um, ask you something, uh, Jackson? Because it's, um, it, your, on your Cosmonaut article, you describe that a lot of the left in America were trying to put a socialist spin on on the film or almost like you know see that it that say there's something that it's that it's you know it shows revolution it shows all sorts of positive things for the for the working class etc and i really struggled with that why why do you think they they try to to do that no i mean i think my my article was a reaction to many articles that were circulating in as you said circulating in the u.s left that were like oh this is a great book because it's like a book about the working class or something, uh, or it's about ecology. And I mean, that's just not true. I mean, this, this, this book is very reactionary. And what I was interested in doing was like, well, people seem very interested. People are interested in enough in this book to really want to make it something that it doesn't seem to be on the surface. So maybe there is something there. And so I started thinking about this book and what I ended up kind of, as I was sort of rereading it a number of times, I was like, oh, there is something interesting in, in this book, but it's not like the sort of stuff that they're saying. It's this, it's the way in which the book sort of like shows how the ruling class develops its own ideology of itself. Like that it has, there's a lot in the book because it's, it's because Frank Herbert as an author was kind of socially nihilistic, even though the book is about the ruling class, it's not necessarily positive about them. And it ends up sort of actually containing a number of interesting scenes where you witness how the ruling class develops a sort of ideology of its own social role and what it is. Um, and a lot of these powers, I think, are, especially in the first book, are good instances of this where how do we understand the way the ruling class thinks about itself? How do we understand the way the ruling class develops an ideology of its own social role and like why it's in that social role? Um, and there are a number of scenes that that do this very well, where because of their ambiguity about the reality of these superpowers that all these ruling class people have, you can kind of like begin to sort of extract 
a kind of a theory of the sort of sociality of the ruling class and how they develop their own sort of so, uh, like ideology. I don't it know if that makes any sense. What was also interesting, I thought, I mean, it does touch on the film version anyway, things of like climate change and, you know, that desert planet, there were plans to make it into a green planet and make it properly habitable and then it wasn't profitable. So there are there are references to, you know, the profit motive. Um, I think the one of the, the the really bad guys, he's uh, he you know he was called Flo. I don't know his name. He floats in the air, but he, he was like you know it's about the profit and just extract, extract or something you know he, along those lines. So they're trying to get spice out of that planet, and they basically left it in ruins because it's all about the profit margin. So it's a there's a bit of a a bit of something there for for Marxists perhaps. I mean, I think what I say in my original article is that that I don't feel that that stuff is interesting enough to make it worthwhile for communists because there just is like there's a long history of this kind of stuff in speculative fiction. Like there's like why Dune? Why why Dune? There's like so much speculative fiction that deals with these same problems of ecology that deals with the political economy in more interesting ways. Um, why this sort of why this book that's actually quite reactionary um and for me that the answer for to that question was well why well it has this one aspect that actually is interesting about like how the ruling class understands itself um because for me yeah just the the questions of ecology and political economy and in, in dune are just not that interesting especially considering the fact that there's all these setbacks for it Mm. Um, it must feel a bit tacked on but you know i mean it is a, it is a as you said it's been read millions of times and you do come across quite a lot of lefties who seem to love it and i was struggled with understanding that thank you very much jackson um it was a very interesting discussion um we want to look at george orwell next and we've got another american comrade with us dan lazar hello hi um, how are you Good. Uh, George Orwell is a is a is a ambiguous figure, perhaps of the left, sort of, but used by the right to attack much of the left. So, it'd be interesting to have your your take on him. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, by the way, I, I I imagine that everyone taking part in this webinar has read Orwell. Am I correct? Is there anyone here who has not read Orwell, who has not read Animal Farm or Nineteen Eighty Four? Uh, uh, that the fact that I'm, I imagine there isn't, uh, that just says a, a great deal about Orwell. I mean, he was an immensely popular writer, uh, and he was, um, his fiction was extraordinarily vivid and well plotted. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, like, like so many people, I read, a you know, Animal Farm around, you know, age 12 or 13, and I read uh, 1984 around the same time. And of course, I had no idea what they were about. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I thought Animal Farm is a great, a great animal story. Uh, and uh, 1984 is a wonderful dystopic uh, novel. Um, and you know, then, of course, you know, a few years later, like everyone, I slapped my forehead, forehead and said, oh, my God, is that what it was really about? Is it really about the Russian Revolution? And, uh, and um, you know, in Big Brother and Emmanuel Goldstein in 1984, you know, oh, my God, that was really about uh, Stalin and Trotsky. Uh, so, so it's an incredible tribute to Orwell that his, uh, his fiction works uh, simultaneously on two levels, as political satire uh, and as a plain old adventure story. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's really a tribute to his uh, remarkable abilities. Uh, and I can't think of any other, you know, anyone else who comes who is nearly as good as, uh, as that in that respect. Um, but when you try to ask uh, why did Orwell, what made him so good, um, I, I think that, that what it comes down to is he was kind of a poet of everyday life. He had a way of sort of settling in on the odd detail um, and seizing on it and uh, in a way that was very vivid and very convincing. Uh, and he also was very comfortable with the contradictions of everyday life. Um, uh, the, uh, I'm thinking of you know, so that there were, uh, Orwell sometimes accused of being, um, of being 
of harboring certain anti-Semitic tendencies. I never really saw that actually, but you know, but one of the, the remarkable opening scenes in 1984 is when he's in a, a movie theater and they're showing a, a, a news uh, item about the bombing of a, a refugee uh, lifeboat. Um, and uh, he, uh, the, 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 the film shows what Orwell describes as a fat Jewess uh, trying to protect a small boy from, from a bomb so that's about to blow the boat to smithereens. Um, and, and fat Jewess is not the nicest phrase, I guess we can say. Uh, many people would today would shrink from that phrase. Uh, um, but it sort of quite sort of illustrates the, well, quite, quite well illustrates the, uh, the, the, the hero, Winston Smith, uh, his mingled horror, repulsion, uh, hatred, sympathy for what he's seeing on the screen. Um, and I think that's, that really is psychologically quite vivid because it shows, it's quite realistic and it shows all the mingled emotions that we all feel in our everyday lives. Um, and uh, at the end of the newsreel, they, they stop the newsreel because some proletarian woman starts complaining loudly that they shouldn't ought to show this in front of children. And Winston Smith gets very angry and says, uh, stupid pro, you know, why don't they shut them up? You know, why don't they get rid of them? Uh, and it's, of course, a very bad thing to say, but it's a very realistic thing to say because we know ourselves that we're often subject to these kinds of, uh, uh, I don't know, mixed tendencies. We're often confused. We often sort of don't quite understand what's happening. We often react the wrong way. Uh, and so I thought this is really quite realistic. Um, and he had an ability to single, to single in, to zero in on these, these odd details and to discuss them in a really frank way that was quite um, vivid. Uh, he was also a very witty writer, a very, he made a, uh, he went almost out of his way uh, to be, um, uh, to be, honest, almost to a fault. Uh, and he often sort of delighted in saying things that were, um, that were kind of uh, politically incorrect. Uh, for example, in, a, in March 1940, he reviewed a new edition of Hitler's Mein Kampf. Uh, and he began it by saying uh, that I should like to put on record that I have, I have never been able to dislike Hitler. Ever since he came to power, I have reflected that I would certainly kill him if I could get within reach of him, but I could feel no personal animosity. Um, in fact, there is something deeply appealing about him. And that was a very odd, strange, but certainly riveting thing to say. Um, he opened up another book review by telling a story, uh, says, um, Reading a certain book, I thought of a rather cruel trick I once played on a wasp. He was sucking jam on my plate, and I cut him in half. He paid no attention, merely went on with his meal while a tiny stream of jam trickled out of his severed esophagus. Only when he tried to fly away did he grasp the dreadful thing that had happened to him. So again, very vivid. Uh, almost um, kind of sadistic, uh, but certainly an image that will stay with you for a long time. Um, uh, he opened a famous essay in February 1941 during the Blitz, in which he said, uh, as I write, highly civilized human beings are flying overhead trying to kill me. Uh, he uh, went on in the same essay to write that, uh, that England resembles a family, a rather stuffy Victorian family with not too many black sheep in it, but with all the cupboards bursting with skeletons. It has rich relations who have to be, have to be cow kowtowed to and poor relations who are horribly sat upon. And there's a deep conspiracy of silence about the source of the family income. A family with all the wrong members in control. That perhaps is as near as one can get to describing England in a, in a phrase. I thought that was a, that's also very good, very homely, uh, but very good, very vivid. Uh, I think very well done. 
Um, Orwell became famous because he fought in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, he fought on the side of the Pum. Uh, that was a Partido Obrera Unita Marxista, if I have the Spanish correct. Um, and uh, that was a semi Trotskyist party. Uh, and that in uh, Spain, Orwell found himself uh, as a consequence on the run, uh, both from the, uh, the fascists and from the Stalinists. And that kind of, uh, in a sense, he never left Barcelona because the rest of his life, he was always sort of like, you know, obsessed with this battle between Stalinism and fascism between Trotsky and, uh, and Stalin himself. Uh, Orwell was never an orthodox Trotskyist by every, any means. He was kind of a left social democrat who did approach uh, Trotskyism uh, uh, on certain occasions, but never actually embraced Trotskyist ideology. Um, uh, he, um, he, towards the, after the war, he became a dedicated laborite. Uh, he threw in his, uh, his lot with the Attlee government, uh, supported it down the line, uh, and um, uh, really had no basic criticism of it. So therefore, he certainly left the Marxist fold at that point. But anyway, I just wanted to, I, I, so I've discussed all the, the, the reasons to like Orwell, very honest, a left socialist. He really felt passionately about socialism. He was a, he was a quite sincere in his embrace of the, of the proletarian cause. Uh, we might object to the ideological conclusions that, that, that he drew on, on all occasions, but he certainly uh, staked out some very brave positions for himself. And, uh, and um, was absolutely fearless in, uh, in, in taking on friend and foe, uh, absolutely unafraid to, uh, to, to attack the complacent orthodoxies of the day. Uh, and uh, in Spain, certainly, and, and, uh, and back home in England uh, afterwards. Um, so I just want to talk about a little bit. So that's sort of, those are sort of the reasons to like Orwell. Now, how about the reasons to dislike Orwell? Uh, and uh, what became um, increasingly common from the 1980s on, 80s on is that Orwell uh, had um, emerged as kind of a neocon uh, hero. Uh, uh, all his, uh, his anti-communist, communist with a capital C, statements were sort of isolated uh, and sort of added to the, uh, to the neocon arsenal. Uh, uh, Certain neocon journals here in the U.S., like the New Republic, it, it seemed like every every week there would be a you know a, a new issue would open up with some kind of you know uh, uh, reverential you know quotation from Orwell. Orwell was the great moral authority, and uh, and therefore he sort of you know was was really embraced by the neocons, uh, and for a lot of radicals that became you know. The enemy of my if the if the enemy of my enemy is my friend, then the friend of my enemy must be must be my enemy as well. So a lot of uh, a lot of radicals uh, sort of took umbrage at Orwell. Uh, um, here in the U.S., uh, a guy named Alexander Coburn, uh, now deceased, a very a very witty uh, columnist for the for the Village Voice and the Nation. Uh, uh, who was very influential on the left? Uh, uh, he was a uh, he sort of uh, took after Orwell uh, and was, I think, had a significant role in, in turning many people against him. Uh, but then, of course, what happened in 2003 is that The Guardian uh, published um, a document that, uh, that Orwell wrote shortly before his, uh, uh, his death in 1950. Um, uh, he had been invited to write for a, uh, how, what was, how is it called, uh, uh, the Information Research Division, which was a secret propaganda unit that was, uh, had been organized by the Attlee government. Uh, and uh, in so doing, he compiled a list of 38 names of people who should not write for the IRD. Uh, and they included uh, Paul Robeson, uh, and a number of others, and, they, uh, and um, the, the names were accompanied by, by shorthand uh, characterizations that many people found offensive. And the, the most unfair one is referred to 
So Paul Robeson is anti-white and that is completely, completely wrong. Um, so with the publication of that document, I think it's fair to say that Orwell's uh, reputation took a nosedive. Um, uh, I felt very sad about it myself because I said, I'm a, I'm a great admirer of Orwell. I think he was really a great writer. Uh, and I think he was a great leftist, uh, despite all his, uh, his shortcomings, his failures, his mistakes. Uh, Cause I thought he really, um, he really played a heroic role really uh, in really crucial moments. And I think that, that uh, homage to Catalonia, Animal Farm, uh, 1984, these are really, um, uh, literary and political treasures, which we should not throw overboard. They're part of the great, they're, they're part of the, um, uh, of, of the left wing arsenal that we should not toss aside. Um, but of course, you know, especially in America, uh, that list, which came out, which uh, Orwell penned in, I think, 1949, um, that summoned up memories of McCarthyism. And McCarthyism, uh, as I'm sure everyone here knows, was an episode in which, um, in which uh, communists, fellow travelers, leftists generally were purged uh, from government, from, the, uh, from, the, from academia, from the arts, uh, from Hollywood, et cetera. Uh, it was a, 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 a very scary, frightening time. Uh, and it sort of led to a uh, a political ice age settling, settling in that lasted for a full decade. Um, so, as I said, Orwell's uh, um, reputation took a, took a nosedive. Uh, I, I would point out uh, in Orwell's semi-defense that um, he was not calling for these people to be punished or purged or in any way you know, forced out of their jobs, which is the kind of thing we saw in America. Um, he just merely said they should not be asked to, be, to write for the IRD. Uh, and to me, it's always real. The real question is the IRD is, uh, as a branch of British intelligence. I mean, to me, the real sin is that Orwell was writing for British intelligence uh, and that he saw nothing wrong with this. And this is at a time when British intelligence, of course, was operating hand in glove with, uh, with US intelligence. And when the, uh, and, uh, when the, uh, the Cold War was just getting off the ground, just being organized, uh, just taking its first steps. So to me, the uh, naming names in this way uh, was, I think it was, uh, although it has, of course, has horrible associations, uh, it, it, it's less, somewhat less important than the mere fact that Orwell was collaborating in this intelligence effort. Uh, and that I think should be borne in mind. Um, but again, just to reiterate, uh, I just don't want to see uh, the baby thrown out with the bathwater, uh, that I think that, um, that Orwell was a, a great writer uh, from whom we can, re whom we can read with, with great profit. Uh, his essays were, uh, were extraordinary. Uh, they make really great writing uh, for anybody who's a writer. Uh, reading Orwell is, uh, is just incredibly educational because it's really uh, marvelous to see what a really a, a, a first-class prose stylist can do. Uh, and, uh, and all of us who, who, you know, who labor trying to put words on paper or on the, the screen these days, um, we all can learn uh, a great deal from, uh, from, how, from his mastery of the art. Anyway, that's it. Really interesting. Thanks, thanks, Dan. That sort of begs the question, isn't it? Can bad people make good art? You know, I mean, this is a, it is a it is a wider dis discussion. What what do you think about that subject? Should we look at art and no, I, 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 it separately? I think the world would be the world would be a lot better place if only good people made good art, but it would be less interesting. Uh, I think that uh, you know, I mean, anybody who's who who enjoys Wagner. Uh, as, as I do. Uh, I mean, Wagner was one of the great shits <laughs> of modern music, uh, but he was also a, uh, an incredible genius. He wrote some of the most amazing music uh, 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 we've ever, um, you know, that's ever been composed in the, in the last two centuries. And so I think, the, um, I think that the paradox is there. And I think that, you know, that Orwell, uh, uh, you know, we should 
take him warts and all. Uh, I wish he was perfect, um, but uh, he was not perfect. But nonetheless, his, uh, his stuff is, is really valuable, really worth treasuring, uh, really worth reading again and again. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. There's quite a few people with their hands up. I also hope that Tam, Comrade Tamlin Byrne, will um, come back in uh, because I think he was going to say something more earlier and then I didn't ask him and I sort of cut him off. Apologies. So, Tam, if you want to come in, please uh, switch on your camera and I'll bring you back in. Um, Ian first. Yeah, I, I agree with you uh, about Orwell. But it, I mean, I feel strongly that you, you don't really have to like the artist to like the art. Um, Nikolai Gogol was an appalling anti Semite, a dreadful person in so many ways. But he wrote fantastic revolutionary novels, revolutionary with a small R, as it were, really quite remarkable. Um, but I mean, my introduction to Orwell was I was on holiday in Spain, and for my sort of beach <laughs> reading on the beach, I took with me the uh, longer non-fiction of George Orwell. So I wrote, read um, Road to Wigan Pier and Homage to Catalonia, and um, Down and Out in Paris and London. Of course, Down and Out in Paris, London was written first, and then, and I read them. Uh, Homage to Catalonia last, uh, and, and it, it's amazing, and it's also a good story about how, in a way, revolutions make revolutionaries, because if you read um, down there in Paris and London and Road to Wigan Pier, Orwell was in the Independent Labour Party and therefore had this sort of reformist approach, um, as you might expect from an old Etonian who sort of been rubbing shoulders with the working classes, um, but. By the time he got to uh, Barcelona, it was remarkable. I mean, one almost one of the first things he says, well, fairly early on in the book, he says, you, all of a sudden you you realised you were in a city where the working class was in control. Um, waiters looked you in the eye and refused tips on a point of principle, um, and just things like that. And uh, and and what comes across from Homage to Catalonia is his revulsion at Stalinism. We, we says fairly early on, um, the thing to understand about the Spanish Communist Party in that context was that they were on the right, not the left. Um, and later on in Homage to Catalonia, he talks about how he's glad he spent his time with anarchists and Trotskyists and, and not with the Communist Party. Because at one point he did try to join the International Brigade, but because he was in the I the reason the, re the only reason why he was in the POOM was because he was in the ILP and there were fraternal relations between them. Um, that he subsequently um, helped um, compile blacklists or informed, he was informing really against people he regarded as, as, as Stalinists. And I think in 1984, the fact that he's talking about Ingsoc, you know, English socialism, sort of a grim premonition of what, um, and of course he wasn't the first one to, of what an authoritarian society claiming to be socialist would be like in an English context and he was horrified at that possibility but again um you, you don't have to like the artist to like his art I think and and um or, or, or I just recommend it to anyone uh, all of Orwell's work is, is is superb um and take each essay or whatever else on its own merits I think but I think it was magnificent thank you for your contribution then thanks um Ian um Tam do you want to come in now well okay um or if anybody's got any more to say on or we'll go for that um and I'll pop back Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. We'll we'll have some other people first. I thought you wanted to speak on Orwell as well. Sorry, uh, misunderstood. Yes. Okay. Um, Paul, please. Paul Fluet. Yeah. Um. A couple of things uh, on, on 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 Orwell here. Um, supporter of Atlee's government. Well, actually, he he was a very, a critical uh, supporter. He was. If you read some of his uh, his article in Commentary magazine that uh, from about forty eight, he was uh, uh, criticising the Atlee government for being too timid on 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 its policies and not doing enough uh, to, uh, of left wing policies. 
uh, he was always critical of, of it, of, of the Labour government in that that sense. Unfortunately, he did go along with the Cold War side of it. Um, but if you actually look at his writings on the Soviet Union, his letter, his his review of um, James Burnham's book, he didn't discount a liberalization in, in the Soviet Union. He said that a slave society is not an efficient way to run a society, therefore seeing some sort of possibilities for internal reform, which of course is what happened a few years after his death, after the death of Stalin. Uh, uh, so his journalism wasn't as pessimistic as 1984. Now the problem with, I think, with, uh, with Aminul Farr, and 1984 is that, uh, as Winston Smith said, you know, I know how, but I don't know why. And that's the thing with Orwell. He under he could see what was going on. And people in the Eastern Bloc who read 1984 said, "Blimey, you can really describe this place, and it's never been here." And that that was quite something to do. Um, Aminal Farm. Why did the pigs become a ruling elite? Well. There's no explanation for it. They just do. Perhaps it's in the nature of pigs to become a, uh, you know, but this idea of a uh, rather charming idea of uh, putting uh, different sorts of animals as social groups is it, it, defective because after all, a, a pig can't become a dog or vice versa. A cat can't become a cow. You know, there's no idea of how one group of you know, the, the in society the, the Bolshevik leadership became a ruling elite uh, so that's a bit of a problem 1984 how did this weird society appear I mean how did the world become three Stalinist blocks I mean this is rather important because uh, you know you've got to explain how you get there uh, again he had no idea of it and um he could describe things very well, but actually explaining it, he couldn't. And that's why he's very useful for the, the right. In fact, it, this has happened right the way back, and he had to apologise for to Dwight MacDonald for, for Abidal Farm, saying, why is this a, uh, you know, people can get the wrong conclusion, and they all well had to apologise. Same thing happened with 1984, he had to write to people saying, no, no, I'm not against socialism, I'm against perversion of socialism. You know, to do, to get it wrong once is, is a misfortune, to do it twice looks like carelessness, as Oscar Wilde's character once said. Um, but for him to become a neocon hero is dishonest, because if you read Abidal Farm, it's clear that Orwell's sympathy is with the revolt, with the revolution. He never saw the October Revolution as a bad thing. Yes, he, he, he always felt that something, there was always something a bit iffy about the Bolsheviks and so forth. But uh, he never opposed the October Revolution, which puts him apart not only from the neocons, but from the Social Democrats as well. Uh, so really, that... That championing of him on the right is dishonest, but you can see through the weakness in Orwell's writings how this has come about. Uh, I put a link on the on the side to an article by Isaac Deutscher, in which uh, he described Orwell as a simple-minded anarchist. And he wasn't being rude, uh, but he was basically saying that the trouble with Orwell is he looks for easy answers. You know, the whole question of dialectics, the whole question of real investigation into things repelled him. And he knew Orwell. He met, met him but, and on the press bench uh, uh, during, the, during the war. Uh, and I think that that explains it. Really, Orwell was at heart an anarchist. And he couldn't understand the, the question of uh, for power, the how social groups become from leading a revolution can become a ruling elite in quite a short period of time and so forth so that's the problem with Orwell he is a simple point. he understood how something happens but he couldn't understand why thanks Paul um two more comrades and 
please try to keep it shortish. Thank you. Uh, Matthew. Yeah, I think the <coughs> what Comrade just said is, is, is right. I mean, I think, you know, you have to understand in terms of, you have to separate the art from the artists. You know, it, it, there's no other way. I mean, there, there are so many artists you can say were complete shits, you know, as people. They were just, in some cases, quite horrible. Um, and you know, the sort of people you would have locked up. But the question really is, does their art show us any insight on the, on the human condition, on the nature of, of the society and the world? <clears throat> and I'm sure, you know, the question has to pose to the art, you know, uh, does, does, you know, and, and anybody can bring, you know, no matter what this, the, 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 their social base, they can bring this, you know, bring insight on, 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 on human condition to, to, to art uh, and therefore has to be regarded as a thing itself. Um, I think, I mean, obviously in terms of, of Orwell, I mean, the key, the key for Orwell is the experience in Spain. I mean, it, you know, Orwell's a member of the ILP, which of course is a, is a left split. At this point, of course, is a left split for the Labour Party. The world's the left of anything we see at the moment, of course. Um, you know, in the, in, in, in the 30s, split the Labour Party in 1931. Um, and of course, he's part of this thing, you know, the, the, what was called the two and a half international, in between the second and third international, which included, of course, the Poom. I mean, the Poom actually, part of the Poom, of course, split from the Trotskyists. That was the point. I mean, this was the point of the argument between, between Serge and Trotsky, for instance. You know, Serge supported the Poom, and Trotsky said, no, they, you know, these, they, you, know you, you can't support these people. They actually, they're, they're in favor of the Popular Front, which they were. They became part of the Popular Front. You know, and this is this is how they were crucified, of course, because they had no no alternative to the popular front, and and, and that method actually, which led back to to the re-establishment of capitalism, um, you know, the, the, the reconsolidation of capitalism and, and the betrayal of the revolution. And the thing for, for for Orwell, of course, is the experience in Spain, but particularly of May, the, the point after May thirty seven, with the 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 attack on the Poom by the Stalinists. Um, you know, precisely, actually including the international brigades. You know, the, 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 the actual headquarters of the international brigades was used as a torture chamber for, 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 for the anarchists and, 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 and members of Poom and the Trotskyists and so on, the left, those to the left of the Stalinists. The Stalinists established a system of their own private jails in which they, they, they treated, obviously imprisoned, you know, all of those forces um, and treated them horribly, people tortured, etc., and killed. And, and, and um, you know, Orwell's own comrades who killed people he knew, who ki killed in, the, in these places. So it's, it's, it, it, it's that experience, obviously, which, which, which informs his, his perfectly reasonable hatred to Stalinism. But of course, then, of course, as you, you know, as, as, as comrades have also said, is it, it's then what theoretical basis does he have to understand Stalinism? Or, or indeed, you know, the nature of, of, of theory within the, within the left of Britain, which has always been particularly fairly low level in, in, in international space. You know, so you can see where, where all this comes from. But it doesn't, doesn't actually alter the fact that he's a brilliant writer and should be regarded as such, you know, and, and, and the book should be read as such. So, yeah, thanks. Mm, thank you. Um, William, please. Now, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go against anything nice that was ever said about <laughs> all. I have read everything he wrote, well, except his uh, his newspaper articles, but I read his anything he wrote in book form in sequence. He began his book form with My Burmese Days, or Burmese Days, where he had an absolute uh, disillusionment with the British Empire when he was a policeman, and he was a trained policeman in Burma, and he exposed uh, the corruption that went on in the British Empire, warts and all. So he lost favour with the British Empire there. Then I read all his books that in sequence, like uh, Coming Up For Air, Clergyman's Daughter. Now, the book that you are putting a lot of emphasis on is Homage to Catalonia. Now, quite frankly, uh, I knew a lot of the brigadistas that were in Spain, both Irish and British, and they have nothing but hatred and contempt for Orwell for writing that 
what they consider a disgusting and lies uh, about what happened in Spain. Now, if you read what he said, he was never in the International Brigade. And if he had tried to, if he applied to join, I don't think he would have got in. But I never heard of any evidence that he applied to join. What he did do, and he says it in Homage to Catalonia, Catalonia, he wanted to fire a few shots. So a few, now first of all, he wasn't in Spain. He was in Spain as a journalist, and he brought his own wife there. Now, you hardly bring your wife to war with you, do you? Well, even a, a, an Eton like public school boy wouldn't do a thing like that. Or maybe he would, I don't know. But anyway, he got wounded, and he got wounded in the neck which is a very debilitating way because it interferes with, it, it, it's you're, you're one of the walking around for the rest of your life. You can't talk properly, you can't eat properly, you can't walk properly. So then he left Spain in total disillusionment. Where did he go? He went to an island in the Inner Hebrides in Scotland where he sat down and he wrote two absolutely disillusioned books, one called Animal Farm and the next one called... Uh, 1984. And what else did he do? He drew a list not of 36 people, of 600 people. He went back to being a policeman for the British state. And he had 60 Irish people on that uh, list who were going to be, if in the event of uh, Russia and the Allies not being able to come to a peaceful agreement after World War II, and it was going to be a war between uh, Russia and the Allies, he was after drawing up the list. And who did he include on the list? A man who actually made absolute shite out of him in the Oxford Dictionary, uh, the, the Oxford uh, Union debate, uh, Sean O'Casey. Now, you can read Sean O'Casey's... Uh, he, he wrote down for, for Bartham in his uh, autobiography. I think it's the third book. It's four books in O'Casey's autobiography. And I think it's the third book. And quite frankly, I think it's compulsory reading for anyone who calls themselves a Marxist and comes from Britain because it shows them that they haven't got what it takes to be a Marxist because they don't understand Ireland. O'Casey made absolute shite out of him and made him look like an idiot. And O'Casey, the only reason we had him on that list was O'Casey at that stage was half blind and infirm. And he wasn't, he was no danger to anyone except his intellect. And that's disgusting public school boy couldn't miss an opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Couldn't miss an opportunity for to have a go at poor old Ed Casey. Now, I have a personal group against him as well. And that is, he picked the name of the chief of police in 1984 as Inspector O'Brien. Well, as an O'Brien, the clan doesn't like that. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much. I did enjoy that. It's just we're running a bit out of time. Um, people put in the chat, you know, often uh, men and wives and husbands and wives went together to to Spain to fight. So it's you know that's not a that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, Dan, would you like to respond to a few things? Uh, sure. Uh, um, the interesting thing to me about uh, about almost Catalonia and uh, and. Uh, uh, um, Mr. O'Brien, my apologies to you. Uh, but um, uh, Orwell, it, 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 almost to Catalonia, sort of made Orwell a great writer. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is for those who are, those of us who are sympathetic to the to the Poom Trotskyist point of view. Uh, uh, before then, he was really sort of mediocre writer. He wrote some interesting stuff, but he really didn't find his métier until until uh, Barcelona. Uh, and um, and I think that really sort of shows the power of proletarian uh, revolution. That um, that he, when he saw the city where the where the workers were in control, he was profoundly moved, but profoundly transformed, and really turned into a very different kind of person. And his uh, and his his writing uh, acquired a, a new vividness and a new and a new uh, a new life. Uh, and I think that's really extraordinary. Uh, by the way, I've I've read the um, the Isaac Deutscher uh, essay about uh, about um, about Orwell. I, I don't agree. Uh, I don't think that that Deutscher was really fair. And there's no I, I admire Deutscher uh, tremendously, uh, but I think in this case he was not really fair. Uh, and um, uh, I I think that 
I think that uh, that he, the, the criticism just really just didn't add up. And I and also I'd, I'd, I'd point out maybe I think his name is Paul who said this. Um, Paul Flowers. You know, sometimes what makes a, a writer interesting uh, are his flaws. That sometimes because the writer doesn't get it right, or he's struggling, or he's you know he's, he's sort of making mistakes. Uh, sometimes that actually makes his work more interesting rather than less. So I think that may be the case with Orwell as well. Anyway, that's it. Interesting. Comrades, if you want to present anything interesting you've seen, any any experience you had, any interesting book, any new film that's coming out, documentary, please get in touch. We're looking for comrades to make presentations. Info at ymarks.com. Thank you, everybody, for participating. And next week, we're get back with ABC uh, of Marxism, a second session with Ian Spencer. Good night, comrades.